Okay, so we're now live streaming. Uh, kia ora koutou and welcome to this open briefing where we will be receiving uh, an analysis of the feedback on the establishment of a Māori ward and um, asking staff questions around that. Uh, welcome to elected members, councillors, community board members, our mana whenua partners who are here today and I'll pass over to staff. Kia ora koutou, everyone, to councillors, uh, mana whenua representatives and um, community board chairs or representatives present today. Um, so today's briefing is around the, um, the question of establishing a Māori ward um, and specifically the community feedback that we have recently received as, re as a result of the um, engagement. So if we could just bring the slides up. So I'll just start by providing a bit of background um, before we get to the uh, the community engagement um, analysis, um, which we'll, we'll look at um, more closely. So um, the Local Government Act 2022 provides for Māori participation in decision making, um, but doesn't prescribe how this should happen. So there are a range of ways that, that this could be achieved. The establishment of one or more Māori wards is one avenue to be considered under the Local Electoral Act. Um, last trainee, Council, as part of uh, its representation review process in 2021, um, which is carried out every six years, considered the establishment of a Māori ward. Uh, at that time, Mana Whenua provided a steer to Council as part of that process uh, that the establishment of a Māori ward was not considered a priority for the Art Confederation at that time, but requested um, to revisit the consideration in the 2022 to 25 trainium that we're in at the moment. Um, council considered that and, um, and also um, committed to that approach. Um, as an alternative, um, uh, Council uh, uh, in 21-22 um, considered alternative mechanisms for Māori participation. Um, and in June 2022, Council passed a resolution that provided for mana whenua representation through council's governance structure, um, which provided um, seats for mana whenua at council um, without voting rights and um, seats for mana whenua across its committees and subcommittees with voting rights. So a background to the, the question of um, the consideration of a Māori ward that we are here discussing today. So um, earlier this year, the government introduced a bill um, proposing to require all councils that had not yet established a Māori ward to, um, to consider establishing one ahead of the next elections. Um, uh, that, was, that bill was amended through the process um, with the result that councils are no longer required to um, consider establishing a Māori ward. Um, however, um, we, have, we have brought this to council for consideration um, given the, the commitment made last triennium to, to dis consider this question. So under the Act, um, Council was not required to consider this, um, but a decision has been made to do so and to engage with the community um, about the question. Um, the, the type of community engagement is not prescribed under the, um, the Local Electoral Act. Um, that, was one of the, um, that was one of the proposed changes in the earlier version of the bill. Um, so the, the type of community engagement that is required is, um, is, is engagement that's consistent with the principles in the Local Government Act. Um, so just some, some scene setting. So in August 2023, so earlier this year, Council um, resolved to consult with mana whenua and the wider community ahead of deciding um, by, we are required, Council was required to decide by the 23rd of November this year, um, whether to start the process of establishing a Māori ward ahead of the next local government elections. Um, a decision to proceed to establish a Māori ward would trigger a representation review uh, next year ahead of the 2025 local body election. Um, at the same time, in August, Council acknowledged its long-standing partnership, a um, 29-year memorandum of partnership with Mana Whenua, and committed to involving Mana Whenua in the final decision um, via uh, Te Whakamaninga o Kapiti and its, and its Mana Whenua representatives at the table. 
So moving on, what is a Māori ward? Um, so uh, under the Local Electoral Act, Council um, can adopt a range of, Council can adopt its um, representation arrangements by way of representation reviews. Um, a Māori ward is part of, of the formal um, elected representation re arrangements. So a Māori ward or constituency sits alongside um, uh, the general ward um, and, um, and therefore is part of that, that whole representation arrangement. A Māori ward is a represent representation structure that would allow tangata whenua electors enrolled on the Māori electoral roll to directly elect a councillor to council. The person standing for the Māori ward vacancy does not have to identify as mana whenua or tangata whenua to stand. However, only those on the Māori electoral roll can nominate that person and vote for that person to be elected. The Electoral Act, Local Electoral Act, um, sets out the formula to determine how many Māori wards can be established based on the population size of the territorial authority area. Um, so based, and it's determined based on a ratio of general electoral population to um, Māori electoral population. Um, based on the current number of councillors that um, Kapiti Coast District Council has, um, this would look like establishing one Māori ward councillor. Um, at present, the Kapiti Coast um, is divided into four general wards, Otaki, Wakanai, Parapara Umu and Pakakariki Raumati. Voters enrolled on the Māori electoral roll um, can still vote for the mayor, any district-wide councillors, their local community board representatives um, and the Greater Wellington Regional Council representative. The difference is that they will vote for the Māori ward um, councillors rather than the general ward councillors. Anyone standing for a Māori ward won't need to be enrolled on the Māori electoral roll, but will have to be nominated by two people who are. The candidate doesn't need to be affiliated with mana whenua to identify as tangata whenua. Establishing a Māori ward has low direct or ongoing costs as councillors' pay is shared from a fixed pool. So um, the Māori ward, uh, Māori ward councillor would come out of the general councillor pool. So if a Māori ward was established, um, everybody that had um, elected to vote on the Māori electoral roll will vote in the Māori ward. Uh, voters on the Māori electoral roll can still vote for the mayor, district-wide councillors, community boards and regional councillor. Um, voters um, do need to switch roles up to three months prior to the election. Um, the Māori ward representation structure is just one way to provide for Māori representation on council, so it is something that is separate to council's um, other, other existing um, representation arrangements for mana whenua representatives um, within council's governance structure, so they, they can sit alongside each other um, uh, rather than being directly linked. So the, the representation arrangements um, around the council table in, in a Māori ward are uh, can occur concurrently and are not mutually ex exclusive. So this is just a wider look at what's been happening around the country. So in the um, 2019 local elections, there were only three Māori wards. Um, in 2022, uh, 35 councils had Māori wards and constituencies, um, 29 territorial and three regional. Um, six further councils have recently voted to introduce Māori wards for the next two local elections. Um, so in the past, and five councils have recently voted against them. So in the past few weeks, Hauraki, District Council, Greater Wellington Regional Council, Wanganui, Napier, Tasman, District Council, Western Bay of Plenty um, have all voted to introduce Māori wards and Auckland, uh, Council Carterton, Waitomo, Kakura, Huranui um, have all voted not to introduce Māori wards. So as I mentioned earlier in this presentation, um, as part of the process, uh, Council has sought um, the views of mana whenua on the question of establishing a, a Māori ward. So Council um, Te Whakamaninga o Kapiti were asked in May um, for the mana whenua position. Um, and at the time, the Art Confederation advised that establishing a Māori ward was not currently considered a priority for the Art Confederation. Um, uh, Further to the decision to engage with the community, um, council also asked Mana Whenua to provide a, to each provide a, a position 
and we've received letters from um, Ngāti Toa Rangatira and Ngā Hathor Otaki um, outlining their position. Um, but we have mana whenua represented us in the room, so I might just, um, through you, uh, Madam Chair, I might just ask our mana whenua reps to um, perhaps speak to their position um, now. Yeah, that would be great. Rāwari Faulkner. Uh, yes, kia ora, Rāwari Faulkner, um, Pautoa Matarau for Ngāti Toa Rangatira. Um, just wanted to firstly mihi to the Council and thank you uh, for the opportunity to come and um, speak to this particular item. Ngāti Toa Rangatira are firmly in support of the establishment of a Māori ward as we see it as an evolution of the current partnerships and relationships that we have and we believe it will lead to a better, more meaningful and authentic and diverse outcomes for the entire community. So that's uh, Ngāti Toa Rangatira's perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Kim Tahiwi. Kia ora, uh, Kim Tahiwi from Ngāhapu Ōtaki. Uh, Ngāhapu Ōtaki are in full support of Māori participation in government decision-making and in local body governments. Um, we see the Māori ward as a step in the right direction, although we understand and know that it has its limitations and work still needs to be done, and we just iterate that any Māori ward does not supersede the mana whenua uh, relationship that we currently have on the table. Kia ora. Thank you. Frank Hippolyte. Uh, kia ora. Uh, ko Frank Hippolyte taku ingo. Uh, ka, ka tua hau hei māngai mō te atiawa. <coughs> now the te atiawa position, we support the other members of the Art Confederation and their support for a Māori ward. Um, as previously mentioned in the previous meeting, um, the Māori ward uh, legislation is not perfect, but anything that gives Māori more voice, more influence at the decision table is seen by us as being important. Uh, and we support uh, Nahapu or Ōtaki in their comments regarding the importance of Te Whakamininga uh, and this should should not be seen as a replacement of Te Whakameninga. And Te Whakameninga is for mana whenua, whereas uh, the Māori ward is for Māori on the Māori role. Kia ora. Kia ora. Sarah. Yeah. So I'll just, just now provide a bit of a um, recap on the community engagement process to date. So um, community feedback was sought um, between the 12th of September and the 13th of October 2023, so recently closed. Um, the engagement channel was a one -way, were one-way channels to inform the community and avoid providing a platform for any inappropriate or harmful commentary. Um, the focus um, was education, engaging with those directly affected, um, and also to gain wider feedback from across the district. Um, engagement included a combination of media releases, newspaper ads and social media promotion. Um, we also um, engaged through um, mana whenua representatives and mana whenua channels to reach, um, reach broader voices in, in Kapiti. Um, particular methods used were the Have Your Say digital survey, um, paper survey forms and collect collection boxes placed in all district libraries. So now we're moving to reports. Um, just before I jump in, can I ask whether anyone, we've got a, a few, you'll have received the, um, the online version. We've got a few hard copies here if anyone would like one. Yep. Is everyone else okay? Yep. So you have up on the screen um, the overall results from the community engagement um, that we carried out. So we received, um, well, community members were asked, do you support council establishing a Māori ward in Kapiti? We received a total of 548 submissions, so on par with the, the previous representation review, which represents 1.27% of estimated eligible voters. 
um, you'll see that um, in favour of establishing a Māori ward for those, um, those 548 submissions, 31% said yes, we support establishing a Māori ward. 69% said no, we do not support establishing a, a Māori ward. Um, of those who supported the establishment of a Māori ward, um, the most frequently cited reasons for supporting the establishment were ensuring Māori representation in local governance, so that um, looking broadly at the themes, that re represented 8% 8, 8 of the yes um, submitters. Um, and the second key theme was upholding the principles and um, obligations of te, te tiriti o Waitangi, which was 7% of, um, of responses. Um, of the 69% the of respondents who opposed the establishment of a Māori ward, um, the most frequently cited reasons um, were, number one, principles of equality and democracy was 41% of the no, no votes. Um, opposition to race-based uh, representation was 26%. Um, and concerns of racial divisiveness um, was 23%. So now just looking at, um, at a bit of a deep dive into the just over 500 submitters and the 1.3% you know, um, of our total electoral population. So the first graph that you have up on the, the top left um, relates to the lo location of submitters and you can see um, the yellow represents um, yes, and the dark blue represents no. So, um, uh, Parapara Umu and Waikanae were the um, were the greatest um, represented the greatest number of submitters. So, um, Parapara Umu 32%, Waikanae 30%. Um, Romati followed um, with 16% um, of total. And as you can see um, across those um, those three, um, the majority voted no. Um, and a, and a, um, a smaller percentage said yes. Otaki um, followed with 8% um, of total submissions. Um, Pākākareki were um, the area where um, a greater number were in favour of establishing a Māori ward, so represented 5% of total submissions. Um, uh, and you can see there Tihoro outside and Pika Pika was represented a, just a few number of, um, of submissions. Um, and the, the graph on the bottom right represents the submitters by age group. So as you can see, um, over 65 represents um, by far the, the greatest number of submissions. So 57% so of our submitters um, uh, identify as over 65. 55 to 64 represents 17%. 45 to 54 is 11%. 50, uh, 35 to 44 is uh, 8%. And 15 to 34 is just 5% of the um, total submissions. So age-based observations. Um, uh, most people over 65 um, opposed the proposal with 73% 70, 70, saying no. Um, 15 to 34 age group, while having the lowest overall participation, demonstrated the most support for the proposal with 61% saying yes. Um, Middle-aged uh, participants, so between um, the 45 to 54 age bracket, showed a balanced opinion with 39% in favour and 61% opposed. Um, sorry, and sorry, Sarah, yeah, sorry, I'm sorry, I, 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 yeah, sorry, yeah, I one of the views yeah. was the wrong way around. So be oh no, just looking at the yeah. graphs there, it looks like the majority to me, unless I'm interpreting what we've got on the screen wrong. It looks like the majority of over 65s are in favour, which. If from reading the summary is not the case, and as you've just said, mm. it's not the case. But from looking at that, it got yeah, mm. you'd think that the majority were in support. So the colour key, oh, the colour key is probably hidden. Yeah, that's confusing. What a great pickup, um, and super confusing. Yeah, apologies. So the so code on the bottom is very, very small. Yeah, so yeah, so just to note in those two graphs, the yes, no colours. Uh, reversed. Yeah, apologies. We'll see whether we can um, we can change that um, before the actual agenda goes out for the council meeting. Um, yeah, no. So so the observations I've been reading out, um, I think, are correct. But you just need to you just need to flip when you look at the graphs. So apologies for the confusion. Um, so and yeah, so I was just 
just at the last age group, which is 35 to um, 35 to 44 and, and 55 to 64. So similar sentiments across those two age groups with affirmative responses ranging from 29 to 32% of the total submissions received. Um, so that's, I mean, and, and this is this is across the 500 submissions we did receive, um, which is, is a small percentage of um, total total electoral population. So in terms of um, whakapapa, so of the total submitters, we had 67 submitters that whakapapa Māori, um, which is 13.4% of the total submitters um, received. Um, electoral roll observations, respondents on the Māori electoral roll. Um, Sarah, we're going to have to yep. whip through this information yep. a little faster. Yep. If you can yep. draw out sure. the key points, yep. please. Yep. So... Um, Respondents on the Māori electoral roll are more supportive of establishing a Māori ward with 56% in favour compared to 44% opposed. Um, and those not on the Māori electoral roll are less supportive of the of establishing a Māori ward. Um, so this this graph here just shows you um, the, the total number of submissions as against to the population distribution. So what it suggests is that um, voters from Parapara, Umu, Waikanae and Otaki, um, or submitters are, are overrepresented if you look at the overall population distribution um, across our district. So key themes um, in the results. Um, I've I've run through um, I've run through broadly the themes um, already. Uh, in the report that you have all received, there is more detail on that, including um, including some quotations. Um, I won't go through that in the interest of time. Um, I think that um, the, themes, the, the themes broadly reflect um, what is up on the screen there. So in support, ensuring Māori representation in local governments and upholding the principles of te tiriti. Do not support, you know, it's about quality and democracy, opposition to race-based representation and concerns of racial divisiveness. Um, and, and on this screen here, you just see the, the various different reasons. So some of the other reasons in support, diversity, inclusion, ethical, moral obligation, redressing historical wrongs, um, kaitiakitanga and sustainable practices, redressing inequalities, um, parallels with, with other Māori electorates and, and support um, if the current governance structure or system is removed. So support for Māori if, um, if there are changes to what we have at the moment, what council has at the moment. Um, and not in support, um, there are some additional reasons there. So um, current level of Māori representation satisfactory, concerns regarding costs, um, preferring the stat status quo, opposition to increased bureaucracy, um, concerns re regarding co-governance, um, uh, views that um, if a decision like this was to be made, it should be a referendum, um, and support for more geographically defined wards. So these are all the reasons that you'll see um, and we'll have seen in re reading this, the submissions um, that you received earlier in the week. Um, so next steps, council uh, um, now has the role to consider the feedback received um, and a report will be brought to council on the 14th of November for a final decision. Um, if a decision is made to establish a Māori ward, this would trigger a representation review ahead of the usual six um, six yearly cycle, which would mean that a representation review would commence um, next year or, or the later parts of this year, um, ahead of the 2025 um, elections. Um, so, so potential costs around that have been factored into the LTP process. Um, so that, that's it from me. Um, happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Sarah. I think we've got a really good um, understanding of what people were saying to us through those submissions whether we might agree with some of the points raised or not. Um, I've got Councillor Wilson first, but mm. I'm aware that, Jocelyn, you had a question you were going to ask, during, which you were holding. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. I actually asked it previously, so I'm, I'm happy to leave it Great. for them. Com Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Okay. Um, <coughs> I know when you when you're doing uh, when you're doing polls and surveys, one of the things that um, demographers like to take into account is the time that you do it and what are the social influences at the time. And you'll probably be aware this poll happened in August, right? Um, for about a month prior 
to the poll, uh, there were a couple of public meetings with Julian Batchelor. Um, Don Brash as Hobson's choice were taking full page ads out of newspapers. And so <clears throat> some of the, the, uh, the rather thinly veiled responses in terms of anti, the equality and democracy and race based, were uh, almost like taglines from from those campaigns that they were running. So I do think that possibly had some influence. Also, at the same time, you had very strong anti-co-governance um, arguments that were going on, and the three waters um, were still getting argued about. So um, <clears throat> I know you don't factor that in when you're doing an analysis, but I think it's something that, that should be thought about because it does impact polls. What's happening around us when we take a poll um, as we know with our own surveys, their snapshots at, at the time. Um, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it did seem to me that there was a, <coughs> a fairly clear divide among young people, that young people were, generally speaking, um, uh, far more in favour of establishing a Maori ward. That's correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah, so the the analysis suggests that young of the of the very small percentage of um, of um, the total electorate population, mm. young those um, in younger age brackets are more supportive of establishing a Maori ward than those that are older. Good. <coughs> Uh, thank you, three, Madam Chair. Um, look, one's an observation and one's sort of a question or clarity. What I found quite interesting with these statistics um, was the age bracket 15 to 34, 61% said yes and 39% said no, yet 65 plus 27% said yes and 73% said no. Um, and I find that quite interesting because we talk about education, we talk about civics, you know, introducing civics into our schools so that people are more aware about things. Yet we have introduced... Uh, and, and you know, I'm a product of a generation, I'm 50 plus, we'll just leave it at that. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, um, Get a card. <laughs> <laughs> not quite. Um, and, um, but um, we, we grew up in a world where the education aspect wasn't there in, the, in this, in this uh, Māori space, if you like. What that statistic proves to me is that our edu education system is starting to educate in that space, because to me a big part of this thing is about awareness and education. And um, I find that a very, very, very telling statistic uh, for me that, that, yes, obviously people in that younger bracket are being made more aware of the past histories of New Zealand. They're taking it on board and making informed decisions where I do believe our older generation are not informed uh, and, uh, and are uh, taking uh, more of a generalised approach to this. Because uh, I've certainly um, recently gone on a journey with regards to discovering uh, Māori culture, and um, it's quite, it's, it's once you delve into it, it's very, very interesting. And I, I surely wish that I'd actually been um, educated in that way as our youth are currently. Um, the, my question is actually around the um, representational review. Um, it, it's been discussed that with regards to how Māori could be potentially, um, uh, how, how they. Um, uh, are um, aligned to vote, shall we say, and the mechanisms involved uh, through the representational process. There's some, um, shall we say, gaps there uh, that could perhaps uh, be tightened up. Through that process, do we have the ability, because uh, we, we would be going, we, we fundamentally look at our, um, at our, uh, uh, our um, voting process, if you like, and how it's all made up. Is there leeway to actually push back on perhaps the legislative aspect of how, how that process works? There isn't a lot of flexibility in the legislation for how you can how you can move through the representation review process. Yeah. Um, it's it's most of it is prescribed in legislation. So, um, uh, and if I but if I understand your question, um, through the representation review and into the elections, you know, civic education is a, is an important part of that process in terms mm. of um, of sitting alongside the, the the framework and the actual representation arrangements. Does yeah. that answer your question? No, look, it, it was more just around um, um, the processes involved representational review. Do we get the ability to challenge the legislation around how how voting in the uh, how how basically the Māori mm. ward works mm. um, as such? Not through the not through the representation review process. Um, other That'd be um, more of a review aspect. Would one it? other council has um, introduced a, um, a private bill um, and successfully. Um, managed to secure mana whenua voting rights 
um, around the council table. That um, a that a is while, in I quite think. a different set of circumstances to um, in Kapiti, where their Manafino had, I think, all settled, um, and um, and they had commissioners come in and, and actually bring Manafino to the table with voting rights mm -hmm. ahead of that that private bill. So um, it's not without precedent, but I. My understanding is that that is that is just one council that have managed to do that. Other councils have tried. Um, yeah, few councils have tried. Um, so, so um, in terms of alternatives, you're looking at the legislative process. Cool. And I just wanted to um, express appreciation from the Manapenua point of view um, as well. Um, I think it's been very clear and articulated. Thank you. Kara uh, <coughs> um, Thank you, um, your, um, your Worship. I was sort of a bit disappointed with. Uh, Otaki's demographics that we were underrepresented in the voting on this and even the result as well, um, which is you know, a, a bit of a, a bit of a shame. Um, just a question for you, Sarah. In terms of the councils that currently have Māori wards or have voted to add um, Māori wards to them, how have they generally tended to configure them? Have they added it as extra councillors or have they, um, say, taken away some of the other council ward or um, district-wide positions and put them in instead. So I'm just interested in the, the sort of the feedback we've got from other councils into the structure and how it would work. I can't answer that question at a general level, but it's something that we could look at and come back to for the council meeting, or we could feedback some yeah. um, something by email ahead of that, um, and happy to do that. Um, I imagine, again, there would be there would be limited flexibility because you're talking about numbers, you know, um, yep. it's, um, the, and you're looking at plus or minus 10%. Um, there's a prescribed, um, so so the equation in the Local Electoral Act um, looks at the, num the Māori electoral population over the general population, total general, and then it divides it by the number of total ward councillors that are, you know, not Māori, Māori ward councillors. Okay. So you end up with, in Kapiti, you end up with one. Um, and so if you've got 10, um, our council has 10 existing councillors, but you've got seven ward councillors and three district-wide. Um, the ratio that's required under the Local Electoral Act has to be ward councillors to one oh, to 10 ward councillors. So you'd be looking at a change in our district. Um, there are varying levels of, um, of councillors across, um, uh, uh, across different um, local authorities in New Zealand, so it would, you know, it would depend entirely on the makeup of the council. But we'll look at that and we'll come back to you um, and see if we can provide a bit of a helpful steer. Yeah, I thought that might be um, like a helpful steer. Yep. And as, so, central government has essentially just said, "Look at this," and then walked away and hasn't really given too much of a steer to us whether they prefer Maori wards. Actually, sorry, I should say the previous government, and we may not have, may not have received anything. So, uh, have they sort of left us in a bit of a vacuum, or have they actually given a preference of whether they prefer Maori wards or not for local government? The, the, so, the, the initial bill, the local electoral legislation bill that was introduced at the start of the year, um, uh, was to require every council that hadn't yet considered a, a Maori ward or, or established one to reconsider that head of the next local authority elections, which okay. suggests to me that there was a, a preference and, and there was. Um, a prescribed method of, of engaging with um, with the community and with Māori and making that decision. Um, that changed, so there was um, I think there was opposition to, to pushing it through in the timeframes that were proposed. It was all was all quite tight, um, so that was taken out um, with a view to, to getting the legislation through. Um, uh, so, um, but I think you know, in short answer to your question, I mean, um, yeah, I think some of it is is political. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Simon, welcome. You're up. Great. Kia ora tato. Um, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thanks very much for uh, for this presentation. It's, it's really interesting. Um, look, I've got a couple observations, but also a couple of questions there. Um, my observations are, it seems like we're not engaging, or our younger population are not engaging with us, and I was just wondering, if we re-weighted those, um, those for and against based on even um, representation, you know, what would the new percentage of for and against be? I'd say it'd be very close to majority. Uh, that's an observation. Maybe perhaps we should look at that and also look at um, how we engage our young, because I share the same um, point of view as, as Cam there, is that why was Otaki representation, the survey, not as high as I'd expect? Um, 
and the, the pool of payments as well. Just wondering, you said that the new ward councillor um, would come out of the same pool as, as the councillor's pool. Would that pool be increased or would it stay the same? Um, just wondering how that would affect um, general payment to all councillors. Um, and the observation there is, um, I know that, um, well, I don't believe that, that Iwi currently, uh, with the current um, agreement, are being paid for their representation. And um, I just see that that is a, a huge cost to Iwi um, to be part of this process. And I would like to see, you know, uh, less of a burden on, on Iwi in that regard. And, and another observation being that because this is a, a fair election, regardless of who's going to be elected into that position, whether they're Māori or not, I can see um, that they should be representing Māori adequately. And if they're not, then they get uh, a chance every training to, to have a new representative. So um, I, don't, I don't feel that there's going to be an issue in that regard either. But um, yeah, it's very informative. And there's just a couple of questions that I had there. Yeah, just elected members, just to, uh, be a bit careful we don't um, stray into debating the, the merits of a Māori ward or otherwise. So, uh, but well, I'll see if you can answer to the questions that were asked. Um, so, um, I'll start with a question of um, mana whenua representation within the governance structure. So, mana whenua representatives are currently remunerated for their role across the council's governance structure. Oh, so, great. Great. Um, and the, the remuneration is to each iwi to determine how to distribute it amongst one or more representatives. Um, and it's it's on par with the um, elected member remuneration that is set by the remuneration authority. Um, so that's that's that question. Um, Wonderful. In terms of the governance pool, so um, that is that is set by the remuneration authority. It's set following council's representation review, um, and it's reviewed each year. Um, and so. If council was to establish a Māori ward, um, uh, that would trigger representation review, and that would need the new representation arrangements would need to go to the, the um, remuneration authority to consider what pool is appropriate. Um, uh, it would it would set an overall pool, um, and then um, and and all councillors, including a Māori ward councillor, would be paid from that pool. Um, there is a process where council um, uh, are able to go back to the remuneration authority to set different levels of remuneration. So there is. Um, there is a little bit of um, provision for for input into what the levels are, for example, for different roles. Um, but that is that is the process. So it would um, the remuneration from Māori Ward Council would come out of the overall pool. Excellent. Lovely. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Who's next? Could we turn off that microphone that's over at the staff table? Um, Liz. Oh. Liz. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <clears throat> yes, look, I, I am still of the view, and I've had this view ever since I was elected, that there is insufficient understanding in the community of the current uh, representation arrangements. And we've just seen a classic example of that where even one of our elected members uh, had an erroneous uh, assumption about um, aspects of the current arrangements. And I just feel quite strongly we need a very clear enunciation of what the current arrangements are uh, in terms of our, the partnership agreements uh, to Whaka Maninga uh, and, and, and how the Murray Ward idea might be complementary to the existing arrangements. I don't think there is enough understanding of that and I think, I do believe that that has probably impacted on the survey results. <coughs> Um, and I think as we carry forward on this debate, uh, look, I think the sooner we can get that information online on the website that sets it out really, really clearly, I think that's going to be just really helpful to discussing these matters with our community, to avoid any confusion, um, to make things absolutely transparent, um, even you know setting out the pros and cons or whatever. I, it, it just seems to me there is a huge information gap there, and and I think it's about time we we filled that gap. And I I think you know we are leading the way in terms of uh, partnership with with Ewe, 
And so it's something we should be proud of rather than hiding away in the back room somewhere where hardly anybody knows what's happening. So why not be really upfront and transparent about it rather than feeling like we have to be defensive about it or, you know, uh, concerned that people there, there, there might be a backlash with what's been put in place or whatever, I don't know what, but it, it needs to be rectified. Uh, kia ora, Liz. So within the scope of what the comms plan was around the engagement on the Māori Ward decision, um, myself and Deanna made inputs into what it was going to look like and the guidance that we received from Democratic Services as well as our comms team was that it was an impartial approach, for want of a better term. Um, there were discussions around pros and cons, um, but again, it was we took the stare that we must remain impartial, notwithstanding where we go to now, regardless of the decision made at Council, on how we promote what the current arrangements looks like look like I might just just add to that just just more broadly um, I think um, I, I think what the point that you've made is a good one um, civic education is something that's on the radar um, uh, and one challenge that we have and, and for those of you that were around the table um, for the previous representation review will know um, the challenge is hearing from diverse voices in our community. Um, we hear from, you know, we know we hear from um, the same voices that engage, that tend to engage with, with council, um, and it's difficult to hear from a broad range of voices. Um, so civic education, getting into schools, um, thinking differently about how we engage um, with the community on things like our governance structure and, um, and mana whenua representation within the structure and, and, and a Māori ward. Um, they're all things that um, we're, um, we probably will never be able to do enough. And there are some people that are not interested in having that conversation as well. So um, it is something that's part of the staff work program. We're looking at it, civic education, and, and how we think differently in line with um, the Future for Local Government panel review recommendations. There's lots of recommendations around how we might do that differently. That's, that's absolutely on the radar. Um, and I think it will be something that we'll need to continue to commit to, um, to make sure that we are hearing from diverse voices and not the same, the same people um, uh, um, with the same things. That segues quite nicely into a potential issue that's been pointed out to me, where we've got um, over 100 submissions from the same email address. Has that been...? Um, so it's, um, it's just the... Um, so staff have inputted um, paper-based submissions that were received into the system so that we can produce a report that is easy to read and, um, rather than... Um, and so, so that is what that re represents. So it's not from the same email address. Right. A Gmail address. Staff are using a Gmail address for that. That's, that's correct. Yep, that's correct. Okay. And just because it was a Gmail address, I didn't think it was a staff address because it's not a Kapiti Coast Council address. It's the how you say platform and how that, how, yeah, it's part of the platform and how you input data into that. Okay. Yep. That's good yep. to know. Thank you. Councillor Cooper. If, um, if we were to have a, uh, a Mary Ward, we're essentially running um, two systems of, of governance or representation, is probably a better word. Are there any other councils in New Zealand that are running Mary Wards and voting rights for the mana whenuas of the area? Um, yes, I don't have statistics in front of me, um, but many of the councils who have recently adopted Māori wards who have had a Māori ward for some time would also have mana whenua representation around the council table. Okay. At, um, at, if we were to vote a Māori ward, is there a fear that at subcommittee, so um, currently the, the three mana whenua have full voting rights in, I think, all, all subcommittees? Um, is there a risk of overrepresentation? It's so um, mana whenua representation at the governance table is a, is different. It's concurrent to but separate to a Māori ward structure. Um, and the existing so the existing mechanism for a Māori ward is a bit different as well in that 
anybody can can stand to that role. Um, mana Whenua have shared the view around, um, you know, um, uh, what that system is currently and, and what might be different um, from a mana whenua perspective. Um, so um, they are different things. So the, the mana whenua, the existing mana whenua representation um, as part of council's governance structure reflects council's partnership with iwi. Um, I think it's um, the partnership has, has existed, um, has been in place since 94. And so that it's part of, of providing one avenue for Māori representation um, um, at a governance level. A Māori ward is, is slightly different in that it is somebody elected to a role um, and under the current, um, or under the existing legislation, it, it provides um, that person with, with a voting right um, at the council table. Um, so it's a different type of representation, but, a, um, but another, um, another mechanism for Māori representation in, in local government and in, in our council. Thank you. Where are we now? Kia ora. Sure, sorry, I'm go, I'll go on to Frank and then hold that thought. So I just want to... Uh, so I heard the statistics on the age groups and the difference in the, in the view of the age groups. I've heard mention of uh, education, civic ev education. I just want to comment on education uh, just briefly and how it forms our view of the world. Um, in, <coughs> in 1999, the case went to the International Court of Arbitration, and the case was um, the Hawaiian Kingdom and Hansen, and, uh, oh, sorry, Lance Larson. In that case, the, uh, the court had to decide whether the Hawaiian Kingdom actually existed before they could hear it they decided the Hawaiian Kingdom did still exist, therefore the case could proceed. That decision enabled the parties to present evidence, historical evidence over about what happened uh, in Hawaii and how the, the government changed. <coughs> in that evidence, th there was historical uh, facts that um, one of the people who helped overthrow the, the Hawaiian Kingdom took control of the education system. And no education, no material, no books, uh, nothing was allowed in the education system in the Hawaiian Kingdom without this, the authority of this particular person. This particular person was a close associate of Sanford Dole, who was one of the people who overthrew the, the Hawaiian Kingdom. Now, this person, over years, prevented any mention of the true facts in history and how the kingdom was overthrown. Over time, the Hawaiian Kingdom fell under amnesia. They had no idea the true background. And similarly, a lot of our own people have had similar education. How many people have been taught about the, uh, the land and how the land ownership changed right here? It's no surprise to you, I'm sure, that the very building we're sitting on was once Māori land. But no one knows what happened. There's some very interesting um, material that you would be interested in, in reading, and that material is found in the submissions by... Ngāti Tō, Te Atiawa, Ngā Hapu o Ōtaki in the recent uh, tribunal hearings. There's a plethora of information there and you will be astounded to know the true history. So what I'm saying here is that sometimes our people are impacted by education and by how education has been screened in the past. And with that, um, I congratulate this council for making the decision to consider a Māori ward. I congratulate you for having the courage to actually open up this discussion. And I congratulate you that it, at, in four years' time, perhaps you will consider four people on the Māori ward or four Māori wards. But in terms of uh, iwi 
as previous owners of this land, some of my ancestors lived on Kapiti Island. In terms of iwi, we have uh, been uh, disenfranchised. The, the amnesia that's fallen over our education system was, was intentional, it wasn't accidental, it was um, very intentional, it has been very effective, and we're looking forward to um, the opening up of the education system and providing real education so that we all begin to, to see uh, the true uh, the true past and what, what really happened there. So um, again to our council, thank you very much for being um, brave and for considering this discussion and being open. Thank you for having the whakameninga uh, for the support of this to uh, mana whenua and um, I, my encouragement to you is to continue to be brave and uh, this is for the good of our community in the future and for generations yet to be born. Kia ora. Kia ora, Frank. <coughs> uh, we've got a couple more. I'm going to take these two, and then we're going to close up. So okay. it'll be Nigel, and then Martin, and then we're going to finish. Because that's quite it all. Yep. Uh, just so, um, a, question, a question and observation. Can't go past an observation. Um, in Poirua, uh, Poirua, prior to the introduction of a uh, Murray Ward, had 10 councillors and a mayor, and they still have 10 councillors and, and a mayor. So they've kind of moved the ward thing around. Horifenua has two Murray Ward councillors. So Horifenua now has 12 councillors and a mayor, so there's 13. Um, so what that would indicate to me is that there's some flexibility around how we might do that. Uh, talking to Sarah earlier, it would seem uh, having two Murray Ward councillors doesn't, I'm not sure the numbers work for that just at the moment under current legislation, but so presumably under a, a review, we would review what the size and shape of council uh, wants to be. Yeah, okay, so that was that. Um, just, uh, just as a, as a final observation, I was reading a piece by Moana Jackson last night, which everybody should read. Uh, the man was a genius. Unfortunately, he's not with us anymore. But um, it strikes me, again, it's like what direction do we want to head in as a council? Um, so we can, we can go down the Don Brash leap backwards at the rate of knots, or we can go so forward. So we're straying into debate here, Councillor Wilson. So yeah, well, I, I'll, so I'll just finish up my observation. Either question or some yeah. observations around the feedback that we're Okay, well, the observation is that what's clearly happened here in terms of direction is that uh, young people have told us the world they want to live in, and, um, and we need to listen to them. Yeah, but, but keeping an open mind. Of course, keeping yeah, um, it open. Um, look, I just wanted to make a, a comment um, around wards um, as such and, um, and Māori representation in them. Um, as councillors, when we are elected, we, um, we basically speak to an oath where no matter what ward we are elected into, we have to take the wider district into consideration in all our decisions. That same rule would apply for a Māori ward. There are plenty of people around the council table and in the community boards space as well that have Māori blood in them currently that are at these tables. There's nothing to be scared of here. No ganging up's going to happen. But, uh, but, but that's, that's legislated. You know? So any decision I make from uh, respect to uh, wider decisions, yes, I take para para umu into consideration. Of course I do. That's my primary. That's what I'm elected into. But I also have to weigh up what happens to the wider district. And I do do that. And I would expect anybody elected into these positions to do the same. I think that's a really nice note to end on, actually. A reminder that no matter who's elected to this table, they're here to represent our community as a whole. So um, just, just what I think we've got a brief wrap up from Sarah before we yeah. move on. And we look forward to the debate on this. Sorry, Kim, I didn't see you over there. Um, kia ora. I just wanted to address um, 
the underrepresentation from Ōtaki, and I'm not speaking for every Māori in Kapiti or every Māori in Ōtaki, but just touching on what Frank was talking about, you know, historically the dem democratic process for Māori has not always been helpful. Um, and so a lot of our Māori whānau have opted out of the democratic process, which may be why you see a very low poll. So unless they think their voice is going to actually be heard, they're likely not to participate. And I think if you have a knowledge um, of New Zealand history, you'll, fact, you'll find that there's evidence to suggest that legislation was actually enacted to take Māori land, um, to stop Māori you know, education, as well as deny our participation in the dem this democratic process. So that's probably why you see low numbers, because the democratic process has not worked for us. And this is one seat in amongst many, and it's occurred for 183 years. So it's been inequitable for that long. And we're just now, in 2023, from 1840, at the table with a vote. So if you look at it from that perspective, it's a long time coming. That's all. Kia ora. Kia ora, Kim. So I'll just pass over to Sarah for some final remarks. <coughs> So, um, as I briefly mentioned earlier, um, next steps are the council meeting on the 14th of November. So, um, in the interim, if you do have any questions that you would like staff to, um, that, that, that occur to you that haven't been answered today, feel free to email the democracy services team and we can, we can make sure that we, um, we either um, email a response or bring a response to the council meeting. Um, uh, and I think that's, that's it. Hara, did you want to make any closing comments? Thank you for um, your time. Uh, thanks to staff and thanks to everybody who attended today. Uh, just to, um, it, for the council meeting, normally what comes back is a recommendation. So 